Friday the 22nd of April 2016, Sydney, Australia. A 25-year-old student, Michelle Lang, made her way downtown to do some shopping, after which she boarded a train headed back home. Though Michelle Lang, after she arrived home, would vanish into thin air. In a tale of horror, a family cover-up and betrayal, let's discuss the heartbreaking case of Michelle Lang. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. Unit 2, move into position. Units 3 and 4, maintain coverage of Sector 7. Well, I'm not guilty. Open and clear, we have a visual. Repeat, we have a visual. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into this episode, I'd just like to give a massive thank you to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. My regular viewers will know Magellan TV have been a constant supporter of this channel and other true crime channels, and we really wouldn't be able to make the content that we do without their help. So please do not hesitate to go and show them some love and support and check out their extensive library of interesting documentaries, ranging from true crime, history, science, space, and even nature shows. Magellan TV was created by filmmakers and their producers alongside talented curators to ensure that each and every documentary on their service is the most premium you can find. I've just finished watching Britain, A Year of Hate Crime, which is a documentary that follows the people and police of Greater Manchester following the worst terror attack they've ever. It's a difficult documentary to watch, so after you've jumped over and watched it, I'd love if you could drop a comment on this video or send me a tweet or Instagram DM with your opinions and thoughts. Use the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments to bag yourself a one month free trial to Magellan TV, including all of their 4K documentaries at no extra cost. Now, back to the case. Michelle Lang was born on Tuesday the 29th of January 1991 in the city of Chengdu, which is in China's Sichuan province. Michelle actually had two names, something which is quite common in China, her English name being Michelle Lang and her Chinese name being Mengmi Lang. For the purposes of this episode though, we'll be referring to Michelle by her English name. Michelle was born to her parents, Mei Zhang, and her father, the name of her father, isn't publicly known. But what we do know is that Michelle grew up in Chengdu and achieved high grades throughout her schoolwork. And Michelle dreamt of going to Australia to further her education and ascertain a degree from the University of Technology, Sydney. A dream that would come true for Michelle in 2011 when she was accepted at the University of Technology, Sydney to study business. Michelle's auntie, her mother's sister, lived in Sydney with her husband and with Michelle's cousin, and to help Michelle achieve her dreams and to ensure she stays safe throughout her studies, Michelle's auntie offered her the spare room in their apartment for her to stay in during her studies. Michelle would actually obtain her first degree from the university before going on to study a second degree within the business field, and it was during her studies of her second degree that tragedy would strike. On Friday the 21st of April 2016, after finishing up her studies at the University of Technology, Sydney, Michelle said goodbye to her friends and boarded a bus just outside of campus, which would take her into the city for an afternoon of shopping. Michelle told her friends that she wanted to go and browse some shops downtown before going back home, maybe pick up some new clothes or school supplies. You can see in this CCTV footage, Michelle walking through the Pitt Street Mall, a mall located in the heart of Sydney. These images chillingly show some of the last moments of 25-year-old Michelle Lang. According to the principal judgment in this case, Michelle had lunch that day with a friend at the fish markets in Sydney. Although it's unclear whether this lunch had happened prior to her shopping excursion or afterwards, what we do know is that Michelle boarded a train destined for Campsie, which was where she lived with her auntie, uncle and cousins. 
Michelle used her Opal card at 4.32 p.m. as she exited the Campsie railway station, being captured on the station's CCTV system for the final time. The final CCTV images of Michelle Leng would then be captured shortly thereafter by the CCTV cameras on her auntie's apartment building at 4.42 p.m. Michelle would then make a call that evening to her friends in which she seemed happy and presented no cause for concern and send one final text message to them at midnight. Michelle Leng then seemingly vanished into thin air. Despite Michelle living with her auntie, uncle and cousin, it wouldn't be until three days after she was last captured on CCTV that anybody would even notice that she was missing. You see, Michelle's auntie had been out of town on a business trip between the 1st of April 2016 and the 24th of April 2016, and Michelle's cousin had been spending a lot of time at her friend's houses away from the family home that was in the apartment building. During this period, with Michelle's auntie away on business, it appears that the family didn't sit down to eat dinner together or do much with one another as they usually would do. And these factors contributed to the unfortunate and sad lack of awareness for Michelle's whereabouts. Michelle's uncle had spent the most time in the family's apartment over those three days, but had worked late and slept through the days waking up late. He just presumes that Michelle had been on campus or out with friends. Michelle's uncle collected Michelle's auntie from the Hertzville railway station shortly before 10 p.m. on the 24th of April 2016. When Michelle's auntie arrived home, she immediately inquired as to the whereabouts of her niece Michelle, as she'd been trying to phone her and hadn't received any response from her. Michelle's uncle Derek responded to Michelle's auntie by saying that he didn't know where she was. Panic then began to set in for the couple, and alongside Michelle's cousin, they decided to search Michelle's bedroom, which yielded no results. They then decided to go through Michelle's social media accounts, her private messages, and personal computer, trying to find any clues as to where she might have gone. Derek, Michelle's uncle, then attempted to phone Michelle multiple times, but there was still no answer. It wasn't until the following evening, on the 25th of April 2016, four days after Michelle was last seen on CCTV, that her uncle Derek would go into the Campsie police station alongside Michelle's auntie to report her as missing. Derek told the police officers that he had not seen Michelle in person since around midnight on the 21st of April, but had actually spoken to her on the phone at around 10am in the morning of the 22nd of April. Derek and Michelle's auntie, following filing this missing persons report, informs the Chinese embassy of Michelle's disappearance. Unfortunately for Michelle's family, the search for Michelle would be short-lived. In fact, Michelle had already been found the day before she was reported missing by her family on the 24th of April 2016. At around 10.30am on the 24th, a walker was hiking along the cliff top at Snapper Point, taking in the fresh breeze and sea air. This walker briefly paused at the top of the cliff to admire the work of Mother Nature, the picturesque landscapes and view of the ocean. Though, as the walker peered down towards the sea, something caught their eye. It was hard to make out at first, but after a few moments of trying to get a better look of what floated in the water below, the hiker realised what they were staring at the body of a woman floating face down bobbed in the waves of the ocean. The walker immediately contacted the local authorities and after several hours, the police rescue team managed to recover the remains of the woman from the water. The woman could not be identified and so the police put out a press release stating that they had found an Asian woman who had been about 180 centimetres tall. As part of the investigation into the Jane Doe case and after seeing the missing persons report filed for Michelle, the authorities decided to pay Michelle's uncle and aunt a visit. And so on the 26th of April 2016, investigators knocked on the door of Michelle's uncle and auntie's apartment. The detectives informed them that they were investigating the possibility of a connection between Michelle's disappearance and their Jane Doe, and asked whether they could take DNA samples for comparison purposes, which Michelle's uncle and auntie agreed to. Now, it's important to note that during the conversations between the authorities and Michelle's uncle and aunt, Derek, Michelle's uncle, kept interjecting and speaking on behalf of Michelle's auntie. 
The officers felt as if he was trying to control the conversation in some way, but they didn't think much more about it. At some point during Derek's discussions with Michelle's auntie, it's unclear on what day this exactly happened, but it's either the day they reported Michelle as missing or the day the authorities came to their apartment for the DNA, Derek told Michelle's auntie that Michelle had been seeing a man from Wollongong and actually suggested to her that this man that Michelle had been dating had murdered Michelle and dumped her body. An extremely suspicious and fucking weird thing to say when there's no real cause to believe she had been murdered and so close to them reporting her as missing, it just doesn't make sense. Did Derek know more than what he was letting on? What we do know is that during Derek's conversation with the authorities when they collected DNA, he told the police that Michelle had been internet dating and had been seeing a man that she had met online. As the authorities were leaving Derek and Michelle's auntie's apartments, they took note of Derek's car. The car was coated in dirt and dust. This wasn't immediately suspicious to the authorities, but it is something to take note of, and we'll talk about this a little later on in this video. The police then asked Derek and Michelle's auntie to come down to the police station to give statements concerning Michelle's disappearance. Derek claimed in his statement that Michelle had lately, quote, been going to parties and nightclubs and started drinking. He went on to claim that she had been using a dating app and had met a few people on there. When asked about when he had last seen Michelle, he responded by saying that he had last seen Michelle in the evening of the 21st of April 2016 when they were home alone together. He said that, quote, maybe we had a salad for dinner and watched a movie which he claimed to have been two guns. Derek then explains that Michelle had gone to bed in her bedroom at around midnight to 1am and actually gave quite a detailed description of the pyjamas that she had been wearing that night. Quote, she closed her bedroom door. Normally she puts a rubber doorstop on the inside of her door so you can't get in. Derek went on to explain that when he had woken up in the afternoon on the 22nd of April 2016, Michelle wasn't in the apartment anymore. It assumes that she had gone out to see friends or something like that. Though Derek didn't see her return back home that evening either. Derek actually gave the authorities a considerably detailed account of his movements and activities that day and of the days that followed. On the 23rd of April 2016, when Michelle didn't return back home, Derek sent her a text message asking whether she'd be home for dinner and expressing that he was a little bit concerned. Derek then phoned up his parents and commented that it had been weeks since he had been to the Central Coast, which was where Derek's parents lived, and that Michelle had been to the Central Coast in the past to see the beaches. He went on to tell the police that he had spent that Saturday night on the 23rd of April just moping around and watching TV before calling it a night and going to bed. On Sunday the 24th of April 2016, Derek claimed to have yet again woken up late, this time close to 5pm. He decided to go to a drive through to pick up some food for dinner before going on to collect his wife, Michelle's auntie, from the train station. Derek explained how they went through Michelle's room when they had got back home and realised she was missing, looking for a note to explain her disappearance, but that they found nothing. On that same day, and during the following day, Derek told investigators that he had tried to contact Michelle via texts, calls, and via the WeChat app, but to no avail. He then stated that he got a camera from Michelle's bedroom to get a picture of Michelle to hand in when they filed the missing persons report that evening. Interestingly, when Derek had checked Michelle's computer and social media accounts, he claimed to have spoken to friends of Michelle via Facebook, and that those friends had told him that Michelle had been going out with a man from Wollongong and another man, a German man. Derek went on to explain that Michelle's friends had told him that she had been chasing guys using a dating app. Following that, Derek told the authorities, quote, My wife, Michelle's auntie, and I went to the Sydney police station because we heard about a girl found on the central coast who was found dead in the water. She was described as Asian appearance and 170 centimetres, which is the same size as Michelle. We found out this because one of my wife's friends sent a story to her phone. Fearing it could have been Michelle, we went to the police station to see if there was any more information. There is nothing more I can comment on about this. I have told the detective everything I am aware of and everything I can remember. This statement is true to the best of my knowledge and belief. There is no person that I can think of that would ever want to hurt Michelle. 
Sure, Derek, I completely believe you. You don't sound suspicious at all. How on earth do you not notice that someone who lives with you is missing and just not at all seem to be phased by it? At all. Sadly, a few days after Derek had given that statement, the DNA comparison results came back for the Jane Doe found at Snapper Point. It was confirmed that the Jane Doe was, in fact, the body of the missing 25 year old Michelle Lang. A post mortem examination was conducted, which reveals that Michelle had been the victim of a vicious attack, and her struggle against that attack was a struggle for her life. She had sustained 31 separate wounds, some of which being stab wounds and some of which being incised wounds. All wounds were consistent with that of a knife attack. Michelle had also sustained numerous blunt force injuries. The lethal wound sustained was one to Michelle's throat, which almost completely transected her larynx, penetrating 40 millimeters into the body. There were nine wounds to her left hand and two to the right hand and wrist, consistent with injuries sustained by somebody defending themselves. The remaining 19 wounds were to her neck, head and torso. Medical examiners determined that while the wound to the larynx was lethal, blood loss from her other wounds could have contributed to her death. It was further determined through examination of her lung tissue that Michelle survived these injuries for a time after the wound to her larynx. The blunt force trauma injuries were identified to have been inflicted post-mortem, likely when Michelle's body was being disposed of. After the positive DNA identification had been made, the authorities asked Derek to come down to the police station again for further questioning. This is where things get really suspicious. When the authorities informed Derek that Michelle had been murdered, he responded by simply saying, quote, we suspected that for a couple of days at least. The authorities then asked Derek to go over his version of events again, and besides adding a memory of actually having gone out to dinner with two friends in the evening of Monday the 25th of April 2016, his story remains the same. Kinda. He actually added a significant level of detail to his original statement about the events that occurred between the 21st of April and the 26th of April 2016. Derek told the police that he had actually seen a female friend to hang out with her on the 19th of April 2016, going to the casino in the city. The most detail he added to his new statement was details of his observations when Michelle had come home on the 21st of April 2016 and during that evening including verbatim conversations they had. Quote, we had fun watching the movie together. We laugh and sorry, this is emotional. It's kind of the last moment we had together. He further went on to say that he had seen a female friend in the very early hours of Sunday, the 24th of April, 2016. And when questioned as to where he had met up with his friend, Derek describes the routes that he drove along before picking up his wife, Michelle's auntie from the railway station. However, Derek was unable to actually give details of where he had met his female friends on the route. He told the police that he may have had some intimacy before asking to see the custody manager. Derek then asked to see a lawyer and his family. Subsequently, the interview with him was suspended. After Derek had spoken to his lawyer, the police arrested him in connection to the murder of Michelle Lenk, his niece. Derek then underwent forensic examination to obtain any forensic evidence. He was then brought back into the interview room, cautioned in relation to Michelle's murder, before the interview commenced. It was then that the police revealed that they had received data from Derek's mobile phone and cell phone towers, which shows that he'd been on the central coast at Snapper Point, where Michelle's body was found, in the early hours of the morning of the 24th of April 2016. They further reveals that Derek's mother and other relatives had confirmed to them that he had actually gone to his mother's house that same morning, something that he had excluded from his statements, though Derek categorically denied ever going to that area that day. So the police pulled out a photograph of a car matching the description of his car entering the state's conservation area near Snapper Point. Derek retaliated by saying the image was blurry, but it couldn't be his car as he had not been to that area for a long time. Now remember earlier when the police officers noted the dirt on Derek's car when they were leaving his apartment? Well, the road that leads to Snapper Point where Michelle's body was dumped is a dirt road, and it was deemed extremely likely that the dirt on Derek's car had been collected as it travelled down that road. 
When the police pressed Derek further about his car, he said that he was unable to identify the driver of the car from the photo taken at 7am on that Sunday morning, and then began to claim that he had memory loss for that period. He stated, quote, I just can't remember anything from that time. I assumed I was asleep. Derek then denies that he had murdered Michelle Lang. He claimed to have not known about Blowhole at Snapper Point, which was where Michelle's body was found. When the detectives asked him whether there was, quote, any kind of closure you'd wish to give the family of Michelle, Derek said, quote, I'm sorry for their loss. That's it. Following that interview, Derek was formally charged with the murder of Michelle. But one major question remained. Why? Derek's mobile phone had been seized when he was arrested, and using digital forensic technology, the police were able to recover photographs and videos that had been deleted from his mobile phone. These photographs and videos were of Michelle, videos taken secretly of her showering and sleeping. Derek denied having any sexual attraction towards his niece Michelle, but the authorities began to theorise that the murder had been sexually motivated as a result of these images and videos recovered from his phone. These images and videos recovered tell a very different story to what Derek was claiming. Now the following information is very sexual and horrific in nature. I have censored parts as vivid detail is not necessary in understanding Derek's motivation. And the following information also forms the basis of the prosecution's timeline of events. And it commences two years before Michelle's murder in September of 2014. Footage recovered from Derek's mobile phone revealed that Derek had placed his phone in a shared bathroom in the apartment with the camera facing the shower area. For the purposes of identity protection, we'll be referring to Michelle's cousin as Phoebe. And Phoebe lived in the apartment with Michelle's auntie and with Derek. She was the daughter of Michelle's auntie and the stepdaughter of Derek. The footage on Derek's phone from September of 2014 showed Phoebe entering the shared bathroom, undressing, showering, and then getting out of the shower before getting dressed. The video lasted just shy of 15 minutes and is the first major indicator of Derek's sexual perversions. This was Derek's stepdaughter that he had filmed, someone he had helped to raise. It makes me sick to the stomach. God only knows what Derek did with that video. On the 15th of September 2015, the following year, a video also recovered detailed Derek entering Phoebe's bedroom as she slept as he pleasured himself. The video lasted just under two minutes and ended with fluids being flicked on his stepdaughter who was still asleep. On the 15th of January 2016, Derek's target changed. He once again hid his mobile phone in the shared bathroom with the intent to film Michelle, who on the footage enters the bathroom to use the shower. The video lasted just over 33 minutes. On the 27th of January 2016, a video recovered from Derek's phone shows him entering Michelle's bedroom as she slept in the very early hours of the morning. Derek's genitalia is shown in frame as he pleasures himself. The footage pans across Michelle as she sleeps. A recording taken just a few minutes after that continues with the same theme. As we know, Michelle's auntie travelled out of town for work between the 1st of April and the 24th of April 2016, leaving Michelle, Phoebe and Derek in the apartment. We know Michelle went shopping on the 21st of April and returned to the apartment at 4.42pm. We further know that the last message she sent was to a friend at midnight. Images and videos recovered from Derek's phone shows that at some point after midnight and before 8.39am in the morning of the 22nd of April, Michelle had been detained by Derek. Her hands had been bound behind her back with duct tape over her mouth to gag her. She was completely naked. One of the photographs chillingly and horrifically showing Michelle's face in complete terror. Most of the pictures taken were of Michelle's naked body in humiliating and compromising positions. Importantly, these images showed that at that point, Michelle was not physically injured. Derek had bound and detained Michelle to exploit her for his own sexual gratification. At some point after 8.39am on the 22nd of April 2016, when the last image was taken, and 3.19am on the 24th of April 2016, when Derek left the apartment to drive to Snapper Point, Derek murdered Michelle by stabbing her to death. The autopsy report was unable to pinpoint when exactly the murder took place, but the evidence in this case clearly shows that Derek took significant steps to disguise his crimes and dispose of the evidence. At 4.14pm on the 22nd of April 2016, 
Phoebe arrived at the apartment where she remained for a few hours before leaving at 7.29 p.m. It was highly likely that Michelle was also dead or severely bound and gagged while Phoebe was in the apartment. When Phoebe was questioned about those few hours, she told the authorities and later the courtroom that besides a brief trip to his bedroom, Derek remained in the shared bathroom for the full three hours with the shower running the entire time. At one point, Phoebe knocked on the bathroom door to ask for some shampoo and Derek opened the door ever so slightly just to pass her the shampoo bottle. Derek told Phoebe that the bathroom smelled and that she should use the second bathroom, though Phoebe could not recall smelling anything foul. Phoebe, importantly, didn't see Michelle at all during this three hour period. At 7.51 p.m. that same evening, Derek phoned his father, and according to his father, Derek seemed to have not been acting out of the ordinary at all. He seemed just fine. Derek didn't leave the apartment, confirmed via CCTV, on the evening of the 22nd of April, or on the 23rd of April, bar taking the building's lift to the basement where the building's rubbish is disposed of. Derek went down to the building's basement four times, once at 4.46 a.m., once at 5.17 a.m., and twice within a few minutes at about 2.30 p.m. on the 23rd of April. It was theorized that these trips to the basement were Derek's attempts to clean the apartment and to dispose of evidence. Michelle's auntie, Derek's wife, told the police when she was interviewed that when she had returned back to the apartment, it was exceptionally clean. She had noticed that a large and previously full bottle of cleaning fluid was almost empty, and that Michelle's bed sheets had been freshly laundered, which was strange to Michelle's auntie as she usually did the laundry of the bed sheets. A number of bath towels, a roll of black duct tape, and a large suitcase were also missing from the apartment. On the 23rd of April 2016, at about 6.21 p.m., Derek had a telephone call that lasted about 40 minutes with his mother, in which he arranged to drive to her home, which is close to Snapper Point, to collect $300 that Michelle's auntie had given to his parents the month before. At 7.41pm, Phoebe arrived back at the apartment, where she stayed until 8.30pm. During that time, Phoebe didn't see Michelle, but did notice Derek using the computer in the living room. It was then believed that Derek stayed with Michelle or her body in the house for the rest of the night. In the early hours of the morning that followed, Derek texted his wife to confirm the time she'd be arriving at the station later that day. At 3.19am, Derek took the builder's lift to the car park, driving out of the car park in his car at 3.34am. Michelle, by that point, had been murdered and had been placed in the boot or the trunk for my American viewers, of Derek's car. Derek then drove to Snapper Point where he would dispose of Michelle's body. At 3.37 a.m., Derek stopped at a petrol station and bought drinks. He notably was acting normally as if nothing had even happened. As we know, at 7.27 a.m., a car matching the description of Derek's car was captured on CCTV, driving through a state conservation area close to Snapper Point. Three minutes later, Derek's mobile phone connected to a cell phone tower nearby. Sometime afterwards, Derek arrived at Snapper Point and carried Michelle's body, which was naked and wrapped in black plastic, to the cliff edge. Derek stepped over the safety rail and threw Michelle's body off the cliff and watched it fall 20 to 30 meters into the water below. Derek then took seven images of the cliff and of the waters below using his mobile phone at 9.19 a.m. As Derek was taking these pictures, two walkers walked past him and he briefly spoke to them saying, quote, I wouldn't recommend going down there. Derek also spoke with a park officer in the car park before quickly driving away. We know that at 10.30 a.m. a walker discovered Michelle's body in the water and reported it to the police. After leaving Snapper Point, Derek drove to his parents' home to collect $300 from his mother. He only stayed there for about 10 minutes, and his demeanour was nothing out of the ordinary. Derek was charged with three counts of committing an act of indecency, one count of detaining a person for advantage or kidnapping, and one count of murder. A further 21 offences were taken into consideration, 19 of which were counts of filming private parts of a person without consent for sexual gratification, and two counts of installing a device for the purpose of filming private parts without consent. The trial against Derek began in late 2017, and Derek pled guilty on all charges. On the 13th of December 2017, Michelle's mother, through a third party, read a victim impact statement to the court. Quote, While the death of Michelle Leng has affected all of her family, it is her mother, Zhang Mi, whose loss is the greatest. 
Michelle's mother told the courts that her daughter Michelle was her only child and she feels shattered and lost as a result of her death. In Chinese tradition, children look after and support their parents in old age and Michelle's mother has been deprived of a future spent with her daughter being cared for by her. Her health has been affected by her loss and she struggles to cope. Michelle's grandparents too have suffered with the health of both deteriorating. Her grandmother has sadly died since Michelle was murdered. Derek was evaluated by a forensic psychiatrist and a psychologist prior to the trial. He was seen by the forensic psychiatrist twice in November of 2016 and the month of the trial to consider the question of his fitness to stand trial and whether he has a defence or partial defence available to him. It was concluded that Derek was fit to be tried and had neither a mental illness nor abnormality of the mind. Derek's history was obtained to carry out the psychiatric evaluation. Derek was 27 years old at the time of the murder and had no prior criminal history. He was two years older than Michelle. He was born and raised on the central coast of New South Wales and had what he described as an unhappy childhood, being teased and bullied at school and feeling socially isolated. Derek's brother was described as having schizophrenia. Derek lost his job in October of 2015, which caused him to become depressed. As a result, he began to develop a binge eating disorder and started to use drugs on a regular basis, in particularly crystal meth. In late 2015, Derek claimed to have been using about half a gram of crystal meth every day. He claimed that the drug kept him awake and made him more sexually aroused. Derek then claims that at the time of the murder, he was using a lot of crystal meth and was experiencing confusion. He claimed to have had memory gaps for the week of the murder and has experienced blackouts. Derek denied hearing voices or feeling paranoid. He was logical and coherent and there were no indications of psychosis. The medical professional went on to say in his report, quote, he does not appear to suffer from delusions. His alleged actions of filming the victim gagged and bound with a look of horror prior to her death, the deletion of images and allegedly disposing of the victim's body in a blowhole at Snapper Point on the central coast, a long distance from Campsie where he lived, were actions that were highly suggestive of sexual deviance or gratification driving his alleged actions. His alleged actions are also indicative of conscious choices, knowledge of his actions and knowledge of the wrongfulness of his alleged actions. The doctor concluded that there was no indication that the offender was psychotic and felt that he may have been overstating the amount of drugs he had consumed at around the time of the offence. Further, if Derek had been using the amount of crystal meth he had claimed to have been using, he would have experienced issues with sexual disinhibition and increased aggression aka he wouldn't have been as sexually driven as he had been. It was further concluded that it was highly unlikely that he was suffering from memory loss at the time of the murder. As a result of Derek's guilty plea and due to the charges brought against him, Derek was sentenced to an aggregated term of 46 years imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 34 years and six months. Derek filed an appeal against the sentencing in 2019, but it was denied. But this is not where the case ends. A strange twist would bring Derek back into the courtroom not long after his appeal was denied. In November of 2019, an elderly woman was found in her house by her daughter holding a USB stick in her hand. The elderly woman's daughter had dropped by her home to check on her welfare when she came across her mother sat at the kitchen table holding a heavy duty waterproof USB device. The elderly woman said that she thought it was a toy, but was unable to explain how it came to be in her possession. She was housebound and only ever ventured out to her front yard. How exactly this elderly woman came across this USB stick is still a mystery to this day. She had no connection to Derek, lived about six kilometers from his former home in Campsie, and the USB drive was discovered nearly four years after Michelle's murder. Curious, the elderly woman's daughter plugs the USB into a computer and opens the folder on the USB stick. She saw it contained extremely graphic videos and photos. She immediately contacted the police. The recordings on the USB stick had been made on the 22nd and 23rd of April 2016 and showed the detention of Michelle and subsequent actions that occurred to her. The files on the USB drive depicted the kidnapping charge that Derek had been charged with in 2016 and sentenced for in 2017, but other files depicted other offences which he hadn't been charged for. 
Recordings lasting over 60 minutes show Derek sexually assaulting and raping Michelle over and over again on the 22nd of April 2016. I won't delve into the extremely graphic details of the contents of the USB stick as it makes me sick to the stomach. It's sadistic and evil. Derek was arrested and charged with further offences on the 18th of December 2019. As a result, Derek was charged with nine more counts two counts of sexual assault, six counts of aggravated sexual assault, and one count of attempted aggravated sexual assault. Derek was arraigned on the indictment on the 1st of October 2020 and pled guilty on all counts. He was subsequently sentenced to an additional 20 years in prison. I for one hope he rots behind bars and one of the other inmates pay him the karma that he deserves. What he did in the position of trust that he had and the family that he destroyed is irreparable and horrific. I know that Michelle's auntie regrets and blames herself and feels guilty for not returning home sooner from her business trip. And just reading her statement about it just really, really breaks my heart. And reading Michelle's mother's statements it's just devastating. And that's everything that I have for you in today's video. Make sure that you're subscribed to this channel for more true crime content, just like this video. I post a new Curious Case true crime episode every Sunday. You can find a link to my social media in the description box below and links to relevant charities and organizations if you've been affected by any of the topics discussed in today's video. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.